So good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on your time zone. Uh, welcome to Water Science Policy's first ever virtual gala. My name is Tyler Carlson. I'm a partnerships manager at Water Science Policy. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, one housekeeping item I will mention right away is that uh, we will be having a, a brief Q&A at the very end. Um, but I will also note if you have any questions during the session, uh, please feel free to type them in the, the Zoom chat and we'll be happy to engage with you through that platform or through the chat in the meantime. So I, I wanna highlight that we have a lot of participants from around the world today, which we're very fortunate to have. We have folks from North America, from Europe, from the Middle East, from North and Sub-Saharan Africa, and um, some folks who are, who are farther East, who are you know, in a later time zone who are joining us. So um, we're happy to have all of you with us. And I just want to quickly uh, introduce our moderators for today. So um, our first moderator is Eliana Harrigan, who is also a Partnerships Manager at Water Science Policy, and uh, as well as Alejandro Prescott Cornejo, uh, who is a Marketing Associate at Monga Bay. So I will now turn it over to Ellie. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, nice, thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. My name is Eliana or Ellie, you can call me whatever you want. And I will be your co-host for the first half of the gala. And then I'll pass on to Alejandro, as Tyler just said. So welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know, Water Science Policy is a multilingual magazine for water-related journalism based on the values of accessibility, inclusivity, and passion. And I say passion because we're entirely volunteer run. So we do it just because we genuinely want to, you know, it's, it's a very nice environment in that sense. And so we've put this gala together with the purpose of firstly showcasing some of our projects, um, which we would like to receive some money for so we can implement them to raise funds uh, for core operations at Water Science Policy so we can see our platform grow even more. And then lastly, but most importantly, um, we've made this gala to build meaningful connections and partnerships with stakeholders in the water domain and indeed the environmental domain. Because as we all know, it takes all of us working together to address the causes and impacts of climate change and water insecurity. So in case any of you are feeling generous today and feel like giving us an early Christmas present, I'd like to point out the QR code um, that will be on the side of some of my colleagues' um, webcams whilst I'm speaking, where you can just scan it on your phone and that will take you to the donate page. Or you can just go on our website, which is really easy to remember, www.watersciencepolicy.com, and you can just click the donation button there. And there you can donate to the specific projects that we'll be speaking about, or you can just make a general donation. And as I said, we're entirely volunteer run. So even like a pound, a euro, a dollar, whatever currency you use will be um, really useful for us. And we're grateful, um, you know, that you're gonna, that you can help us in that way. Um, so now over to our magical co-founders, Chris and Celia. Thank you very much, Ali, and um, well, uh, thanks everybody for being uh, here with us today um, on your Sunday um, afternoon, evening or morning, depending where you are. So first of all, um, why water science policy? Uh, so you can you can see here from the from the speech bubble. Um, well, water science policy is, first of all, um, a passion project and uh, Chris and myself and we're the co-founder, we, we like to call it our lockdown uh, baby. Uh, why is that? Because actually the idea was born at the beginning of the pandemic um, last year in May. Um, and uh, the reason why it was born, it, it was because we, uh, we were staying at home and uh, we had a lot of time to, to think about, um, uh, to think about um, our, our passion and our goals. And uh, we both graduated from uh, Oxford School of uh, Geography and the, and, and the Environment uh, a couple of years back. Um, and um, being at home was actually a unique opportunity that made us reconnect literally from the opposite side of the world. In fact, at that time, I was living in Manila in the Philippines and Chris was uh, sitting in, in, in Canada. And we thought, why don't we start a blog? 
So this is uh, why you can see that on the speech bubble. Well, since then, um, water science policy has actually grown exponentially and it became um, a global multilingual platform and then the magazine for water journalism. And we now have a team or more than 100 volunteers uh, from about 25 countries around the world. So this became a passion project for all of us. Um, some of our core values that Ali mentioned before are really professionalism, inclusiveness, and also universalism. And in fact, our mission is to use water as an entry point to bridge different gaps between natural and social sciences, also science and policy, and, and to integrate research and practice a bit more closely together. So let me stop here and uh, just give the floor to my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Chris. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sylvia. And um, I'll be covering the numbers and then lead on to the first session. Um, just to really add to what Sylvia already said, giving that a bit of context, um, we did launch um, about one and a half years ago and since then have published over 100 pieces and um, we produced in less than half a year over 500 translations, which I find quite impressive. We only introduced this translation feature um, this year when we relaunched the website. Um, and we do that across opeds, policy briefs, photo stories, and um, also produce videos. You will still see three videos um, just in this um, well, gala today. Um, and we so far had over 300 contributing authors um, recently also published a letter that had um, over 250 co-signatories um, to the World Trade Organization, which was really nice. And yeah, covered 15 languages, more than 15 languages, have plenty of partnerships, and um, so far also two service contracts with um, different organizations in the water space. And um, that translates also to some socials um, that we think have grown rather nicely um, without any budget spent. And we got good feedback and good traction and um, also are really excited by all the effort and passion and everything that is really being put in by, by the volunteers. And they're spread all over the world, as Sylvia already said. And um, we've, we are putting a lot of hours into this um, Sylvia and myself between us probably at least 40 hours a week and, and all the translation efforts um, and all the partnerships and video editing is really, really very impactful um, and to see all the, the, the love and passion that goes into this from a lot of people. And it is also a big opportunity um, for, for some of the folks that are involved, um, some were already able to leverage this um, to, to score other things, to win prizes. Um, and yeah, it's been really nice to see. And all of this would not be possible um, without finding the right people at the right time. And um, with that, I'll also lead over to the first session right away, um, which is the River Project. Um, and this is the first, and I think also the most advanced project that we're trying to raise funds for. And um, this River Project or water science policy in its current form would not have been possible without me um, and um, my girlfriend back then stepping off off a boat um, in India and in Kochi at the right time. Um, because as we walked through this crowd that you see there, um, all of a sudden there was this, this guy that we had spent um, three months prior um, after like traveling three weeks through India in trains and like on the, like seeing him on the other side of the, of the country. Um, all of a sudden, Paul, a um, friend of ours, was there in this crowd and was like, hey, man, hello. And we had not planned this. Um, and by the time, we hadn't really known him very well. But it was such a coincidence um, that we all got really excited and like, we spent the rest of the day together. And um, turns out Paul is like this really talented and amazing web developer. And um, without him, um, we wouldn't see water science policy in its current shape. And we also wouldn't have come up with the river project that, we, that we're trying to develop now or that we are already developing. So what am I talking about when I say river project? Um, it's probably best if I start um, not with a slide, but with a, um, with a overview of um, 
what this is about. Um, it is an interactive platform that um, basically walks you from the source to sea um, of a river, picture clouds uh, forming, a raindrop falling, hitting the top of a mountain, and um, the drop continuing its journey all the way downhill. And um, you then join this drop or boat or wave or fish or whatever on its journey from the source to the ocean. And along the way, um, you get to see all kinds of information of that river and um, are then forwarded to other projects. This, what you see here, is a very early demo and it's going to change substantially um, from what we have in mind. Um, but it's just to illustrate the functionality. And the motivation behind this is really, again, to, to, to bridge the gap, um, what Sylvia was saying earlier, because one of the biggest gaps um, in environmental, well, activism or journalism, or just really about water is um, the fresh water and the marine spaces, which um, also Torkel and Natal are going to touch on then. And our objective here is to really take rivers, we're working on the Mekong and the Euphrates already, take those rivers, show the challenges that they're facing within a changing climate, and then identify best practice solutions, the projects that are working, the communities that are figuring out ways to deal with a changing environment, um, and really illustrate those on these interactive websites and um, yeah, communicate ways in order to address those challenges. And this um, really is a nice way for us to bring together arts and science communication and web development and to bridge some gaps um, in the water and marine space. It's also the decades of the oceans and all the problems or many of them in the oceans arise from the rivers. And this is something that we really try to, to communicate there. Um, our cost estimate for that is after having had some conversations with Reuters um, who did something similar in the past um, is about 20,000 euros in total. Um, split quite evenly between web development and um, the animation part. And on that note, I will then hand it over to Tokil, uh, or Atal, sorry, Atal. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, perfect. Yes. So uh, I will briefly talk about. Uh, why project like uh, Hilltop to Ocean is crucial in one of the significance of, of, of these projects uh, or project like this one. Uh, uh, so I just have one slide and I illustrated some uh, points there that, that indicates uh, the significance of H2O. So uh, Chris, can you change the slides to the, to the next one? Uh, uh, okay, perfect. So, so here uh, I have some uh, some topics. The first one is if you see like the river basins by nature. Uh, so it is, as we all know, the bloodstream of terrestrial life uh, for everything, not just for human beings. Uh, it is at the same time river basins are uh, especially continuous. Uh, they're like like how this project is. Uh, Illustrating it is from hilltop all the way down uh, to the ocean is uh, is continued uh, unless it is intervened by human beings. And at the same time, it is also highly uneven distribution of freshwater res uh, resources. Uh, with the Anthropocene, what happens that this distribution is further uh, skewing. Uh, it is dry regions are becoming more dry in, in some regions that are more rich on fresh water becoming more having more water uh, with both of them are like bad news uh, the rivers as we all know they have uh, unidirectional flow uh, and at the same time they also provide very vital ecosystem services so this is overall the nature of fresh water or which river basins are a big part of that uh, with all these uh, there is a high dependency on these water resources. Uh, only 13% of the 2.5, something around 2.5% fresh waters are accessible. The remaining 87% uh, are not accessible. Either they are 
in deep aquifers or they're in, in, in ice caps. Uh, nearly 40% of rivers are there shared. When I'm saying shared, it is by country. So they are riparian rivers. In 148 countries worldwide, they are highly dependent on these shared resources, which are total of over 2.7 billion people. Uh, now, with this high dependency, there are very serious uh, uh, intervention in river basins. Uh, now, I'm not going into this technical aspects of what type of interventions are there. Uh, from the beginning, especially starting with modernization theory, uh, interventions in, in rivers and basins are political process. So it is a fight between either internationalizing uh, these basins or uh, territorializing these, these basins. Uh, both ways, uh, what happens it is state is at the center of these politics. So it is both like a status type of, of interventions. Uh, now, why this is important that I'm bringing this in here, because uh, with these interventions, with these highly politicized understanding of fresh water in the world, is becoming more like they're turning rivers to uh, something like objects to be owned. Uh, with that problem, with high intervention, there are like over 2.8 million dams of different size on these river basins, uh, out of which 40, uh, 59 thousands are uh, large dams, which have specific definition. And 25% rivers, 25% of all these thousands of rivers, they don't reach the ocean. So bad news for the project that somehow they will, I mean, they will not go all the way to the ocean for this 25%, but this is the fact now. Uh, that these 25% of rivers, they somehow dry out on the way uh, down the stream to the, to the ocean. Uh, with this, what happens? We already know from science, from emerging science, that uh, rivers or freshwater, they already are overstepping its natural limits. Now, uh, when it's overstepping the natural limits, what happens that we only have, because of the nature of this very uh, spatially continuous nature of rivers, what we see is a very cross-sectional view, a very limited view of, of these, of the rivers, as well as the interventions and the problems. Uh, for example, if we see like, I mean, Colorado River in Western United States, what we see is these big, big beautiful dams. Uh, and that give a very fake uh, view of the, of the river that, hey, guys, you can use river for these big, these type of projects, uh, and uh, which is beautiful, which is a sign of human power. Uh, but we don't see the problem down the spring, uh, down the stream, that before reaching the ocean, this river dries and most of the times of the year, this river is not flowing to the ocean. So, uh, and that is not just with, with Colorado River. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the figure 25% of the rivers has the same fate now and more of them are joining this club. So with that say, the project, like I'm thinking like I'm not part of this uh, H2O project officially, uh, but when Chris was going to this project, and it was really promising. So why, for me, looking at this project is that uh, the most important thing is that it is somehow taking out the rivers from the from somehow the sh the sh the shades of politics. It is giving rivers a very holistic overview, both longitudinal as well as granular. For example, if this is very well designed and you, if you can follow the river all the way from its origin to the, to the end, uh, you can see in particular, you can observe what happens in a particular area. So that it will be a very granular approach to the river. But at the same time, it also gave a very longitudinal approach to see what is happening in the river. What this will cause? This will has both legal and administrative 
aspects of shear waters. Uh, in terms of data, in terms of generating more awareness, uh, and also uh, facilitating collaboration between riparian states and also helping uh, a river, showing rivers as not just a source of, of energy or a source of resource, but a very vital ecosystem. Uh, so with that said, for me, a project like, like H2O is really, I see it like promising and at the same time, uh, a, a first step towards uh, paradigm change, not just in managing the water, but first in understanding freshwater resources and then how to manage it. Unfortunately, within, I can say like a couple of centuries or even more than that, uh, water became just a commodity uh, for the market. Uh, and that commodity and that understanding then gave birth to it as different types of management in which eventually now we see it that uh, commodification of water is really not a solution, but a problem. And that problem we see it in terms of this emerging knowledge that how this vital source of nature is overstepping it is natural limits. I guess I will stop here, Chris. Sorry, carry on. Uh, I'm done with the, with the presentation. Thank you so much for that um, and for sharing your thoughts. Uh, let me just unraise my hand. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Atal. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Torkel Clausen. Dr. Clausen is currently the chair of the Action Platform for Source to Sea Management and senior advisor to the Global Water Partnership. In his Global Water Partnership role, Dr. Clausen is the chair of the technical reference group for the Africa Water Investment Program. Over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and um, I shall try my best to stay within the five minutes allotted to me. Uh, let me say that my key message is that when you talk about the river, uh, don't stop at the coast, think about the sea. I graduated as a hydrologist 50 years ago <laughs> and worked with water people who talked to each other for 50 years. And I'm now uh, focusing on why that was probably not the right thing to do. If you look at the hydrological cycle and if you know what's happening and if you read the IPCC reports on climate change, you know that our oceans are dying and they are dying largely due to an unhappy combination of freshwater mismanagement and climate change. And the hydrological cycle, as we know it, is gradually turning from a virtuous to a vicious cycle. And we've got to stop that. And then there's increasing competition, as also Atal mentioned, for scarce and often polluted water that threaten our livelihoods and threaten biodiversity, threaten our ecosystems. Uh, and because an increasing world population needs more food, more energy, more goods and services. And climate change makes it adds to the problem. I mean, both in terms of water scarcity, in terms of increased variability, more floods, more droughts, and sea level rise. But at the same time, in our oceans, we see dead zones due to oxygen depletion. We see plastic islands, we see dying coral and mangroves and we see valuable species disappearing. And the vital capacity of the oceans to rescue our planet by absorbing carbon is under serious threat. And from where? With 80% of all wastewater flowing untreated into the sea, along with millions of tons of fertilizers, pesticides, plastic, and other stuff, maybe, my own and your own freshwater community is guilty of destroying the ocean due to our mismanagement of freshwater. And, and look at one of your basins, look at the Mekong. Uh, I lived in the Mekong Basin for three years and worked with it for 20 years. And look at the dams there. 
the dams built in the Mekong, well, they generate electricity that we need. They provide safe water. They save water from the wet to the dry season. They save us from floods. But at the same time, these dams come at a cost of food production and ecosystems downstream. They also catch the sediments that would otherwise reach the sea with the result that our coasts are eroding. And, and they prevent fish from migrating. So we need these dams, but we need the right ones. And how do we build the right ones where the benefits outweigh the costs? We also, and if you look at the basin, full of agriculture. We, we grow our food using fertilizers and pesticides, but we let the residues pollute our rivers and continue into the sea. And we build cities and mines and factories that discharge waste, plastic, toxic materials and chemicals into our river and onto the sea. So, and it works both ways, in fact. When we say in our platform, source to sea, it's both ways. The sea affects us. It affects our coast and basin through cyclones that increase with climate change, salinity intrusion, and erosion. Uh, so, in the water resource community, and I spent more than 20 years of my life on integrated water resources management in Global Water Partnership, we are good at that. We are good at integrated water resources management, integrated river basin management, water, food, energy nexus, and so forth. And we have made great progress in thinking integrated within the water community for a long time. But in the process, I'm afraid we have forgotten the ocean downstream. We, we wake up in the morning and water people and think about SDG 6, but sometimes forget that SDG 6 on water is critical to achieving the other SDGs on poverty, on food, on health, energy, land, and of course, oceans. And look at the one on the oceans. There's an SDG 14 on the oceans. Target one of that SDG talks about land-based activities affecting the sea. Yet, if you look at the ocean community, they rarely talk about SDG 6. They rarely think about freshwater as being the problem uh, that create these issues. So the message here is that these two communities, the freshwater and ocean, they, they simply need to get out of our silos and talk to each other. And we don't do that. And we need to do that to work across SDGs to ensure coordinated management of freshwater and ocean. Fortunately, it happens in, in some basins, not in all. Uh, we have in the platform like the Baltic, the Danube, the Orange, and others, where these things are starting to happen, but not too many places, and it is not penetrating really to the regional and global policy and action level. So you have made a lot of commercial for WSP, <laughs> and I like that, uh, and I will support that. Let me end with a small commercial. We have a platform, action platform, source to sea management. Uh, we now more than 30 national, regional, and global partner organizations that help stakeholders making this happen with knowledge, with tools, with cases, and action support. And, and I hope that you will join, WSP will join this platform. It doesn't cost you anything for your time. Uh, in, in that process, you can learn from other partners of the platform and you can share your challenges and, and experiences from the H2O River Project with us. So I look forward to that being a contribution from the freshwater community to do better than we have done so far. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kausen, for that interesting talk, which greatly intensified my existential crisis. <laughs> um, but no, it's really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, so that concludes session one, everyone. I hope you learned a lot about rivers. What was your favorite fact that you learned about rivers? Have a think. And while you're thinking about that, don't forget that if you scan our QR code, um, you can go straight to the donation page where you can give money to help fund this project. And that being said, on to session two. And I will now pass over to Frantisek to introduce our second project. 
Franchek also volunteers for Water Science Policy. He helps out with social media channels and is the in-house videographer, or as I like to call him, the video guru. And you're about to find out why. Fran, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellie. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us this uh, evening or morning, depending on where you are. So yeah, my name is Frantisek. I'm from the Czech Republic, uh, sort of the in-house visual artist for Water Sense Policy. And I directed and edited our short award-winning film uh, called My Water, uh, which embodies the spirit of uh, water science policy as a global platform uh, where not only scientists and professionals can share their thoughts on water, but it's open to literally everyone. Uh, so in this movie, we highlighted the importance of water for humanity across continents and cultures. So without any further ado, let's just watch the movie. Ich heiße Christian und ich komme aus München, Deutschland. I'm Ellie from New Zealand. My name is Ian and I live in Maryland in the United States. My name is Veronica de Sacedon, Guadalajara. And this is my water. 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 Although access to safe drinking water has improved in the past two decades, the struggle to ensure that everyone has their water needs fulfilled is far from over. And how long does it take to collect drinking water? Five seconds. Twenty seconds. Twenty seconds. Six seconds. Six seconds. And why is water so important? Um meine Zähne zu putzen. Because I can make my tea in the morning. Canta refrescarme in verano. Seuros natat mas chokot yagat kewil seuros mini irut mindi undes patka. It doesn't matter if you live in the United States, the Philippines, or Mongolia. Water matters equally to you and to those around you, near or far. So value it, protect it. Okay, I may be uh, too involved with this uh, short film, but I always get uh, emotional when I, when I see it. So uh, the same idea that brought this film to life, uh, the idea that uh, of engaging members of various local communities from all around the world in uh, collection and reporting of data about their experience with water issues, is behind our uh, citizen science for, for global water mapping projects. Uh, and in this project, uh, for which we're aiming at raising a grand total of uh, 22,000 euros, we want to create a central hub for water-related data collection and develop new indicators regarding access to water and sanitation. Uh, so to give all these previous buzzwords some meaning, anyone will be able to enter uh, water-related data through an open access website, uh, which would then map out in an accessible format. And these data could then be used by researchers, policymakers, and activists, and this would truly be global. So anyone, anywhere uh, would be enabled to enter their, their data. It doesn't matter whether they are living or experiencing water scarcity in rural Zambia or in rural Florida. And this would be the first project of its kind anywhere in the world. And we will be eternally grateful if you decided to support it. It's quite easy. You can just scan the QR code. It's somewhere around my head, or you can just go to our website. Or you can just support us by following our social media accounts, especially our Instagram, which is which is run uh, by me. Uh, okay, but enough of uh, social of uh, self promo, and I'm going to uh, get back to get back to Ellie. Thank you so much. 
Thanks, Fran. So now we move on to the, the speakers for session two. First uh, is our content creator, Neil Patel. Neil is a staff associate with Tetra Tech's water resources and infrastructure sector, where he currently serves as assistant product manager on USAID's WASH FIN activity. Neil? For sure. Uh, thanks, Ellie. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out to support water science policy. As Ellie mentioned, my name is Neil Patel. Uh, my co-author Katie wasn't able to be here today, but I'm going to speak briefly on some key ideas from our ongoing research on using blockchain to strengthen leak prevention, uh, primarily using the case study of Ciudad de Mexico or CDMX. Uh, before we begin, I also want to give some quick recognition to our research supervisor, Professor Jane Cohen at the University of Texas School of Law. So um, just starting quickly with some historical context, Ciudad de Mexico faces a paradoxical water crisis. So parts of the metropolitan area receive significant precipitation and even routinely flood, yet about one fifth of the area's more than 21 million residents face persistent water shortages, which begs a core question. How does a city that regularly floods run out of water? And so today, water is extracted from the aquifers that service Ciudad de Mexico at nearly double the natural recharge rate, and this will only get worse due to climate change and population growth. So given the local, uh, limited local availability of water in the city, See that the Mexico imports about two thirds of its water from the Kutsamala and Lerma systems, which are transported from over 100 kilometers away and distributed within the city limits through nearly 12,000 kilometers of tertiary network. The reason why this is of concern for policymakers today is that half these pipes were constructed over 60 years ago, and thus nearly 40% of the water transported through the system is lost due to leaks. This is a substantial issue as it contributes to the over extraction of available resources as water pumped at the source doesn't reach the end users at the end of the day. So what our paper does is it looks at the various stakeholders involved in maintaining and repairing CDMX's pipelines at all levels of the asset life cycle, including government entities, consumers, O&M providers, and investors. And ultimately, we try to see how blockchain, and specifically smart contracts, can streamline the everyday interactions between these groups of stakeholders and reduce inefficiencies in responding to leaks, both before and after they occur. So with that, uh, we can begin by discussing what exactly a blockchain is. So a blockchain is a decentralized record of transactions designed to make record keeping effectively tamper-proof. And there are three key elements to this. There's a peer-to-peer -peer network of users which conduct transactions between each other. There's a consensus mechanism that determines what types of transactions are considered valid and who can validate types of transactions. And the third is the most com critical component, which is a distributed ledger a ledger that is recorded individually on each device, as opposed to in a centralized location like a database. And the reason why this is so important is because in a database or centralized system, there's a singular point of vulnerability for manipulation. If I wanted to maliciously edit information, I only have to go to one place. But on a blockchain, each device on the network records every single transaction. So manipulating records would require manipulating the majority of devices on the network to avoid full on rejection. And what this does is create an efficient mechanism for ensuring the validity of recorded data, basically streaming and streamlining and scaling up the ability for various actors to complete transactions with each other without needing human resources or a quote unquote middleman. And a core way this functions is through something called smart contracts, which are automated programs run on a blockchain that hold and automatically release payments after the blockchain uh, validates that certain conditions have been met. And so what we're trying to do is identifying a few opportunities for using smart contracts in blockchain to streamline these types of everyday transactions and make response times more efficient. And so one great example of this comes in just routine operations and maintenance, sending a repair crew to fix a leak when it occurs, as opposed to wasting valuable staff time in processing, queuing, and reviewing maintenance work in response to leaks, what blockchain can do is automatically generate smart contracts for service work when a remote sensor detects a leak triggering an automatic notification to a local service crew in the area. And then it will release the payment when the network notes that a certain parameter that it predetermines, such as a return to a normal flow rate, has been met. It reduces the entire need for human intervention and makes response times more efficient, preventing water from being lost in the process. Blockchain can also be used to build trust with consumers by maintaining a public ledger of data on water quality, flow rate, and maintenance. Bills can be generated through smart contracts that only allow payments to be requested upon satisfactorily meeting key standards for quality, flow rate, and timely repairs, 
which helps consumers be certain that they're paying for quality services they actually received, which leads to a higher repayment on tariffs, which, as most policymakers know, is the one of the most important forms of short-term liquidity financing for a utility. And finally, blockchain can streamline the diligence and reporting process for financial investments in the water sector. It can provide a transparent record of investments and returns for potential investors to consider. It can streamline reporting to regulators, track fractional ownerships or transferring of bonds and shares, and instantly settle liquidations or payments to investors in the case of green bonds. Or it can be used to structure through smart contracts, performance-based payments, where smart contracts are used to release subsequent disbursements based on achieving pre-established performance benchmarks. So to keep in conclusion and to not take up too much of your time today, what blockchain and smart contracts offer is the ability to scale up and expedite everyday interactions between stakeholders at critical stages of the asset maintenance lifecycle, ultimately facilitating a systems-based approach to leak prevention that prevents leaks both before and after they occur. So um, thanks to Water Science Policy for giving us the chance to share our work today, and we definitely hope you give them your support. Thank you, Neil, for that talk. As a natural technophobe, <laughs> I tend not to understand these things or how they work, but you just explained it really well. So yeah, thank you for sharing your article with us. Um, so our next speaker is Majun. Uh, Majun is an award-winning journalist, environmentalist, and environmental consultant. He is currently the director of the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs, or IPE. However, Majun cannot attend physically because I think it must be around 2 or 3 a.m. for him. So due to time zone differences, we've uh, got a pre-recorded video to show you. But we fortunately have um, Linda Greer, who also works for IPE, to represent uh, Majun and to answer any questions that you may have during the Q&A section. So yes, video please. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be with the uh, Water Science Policies Virtual Gala. With all eyes on COP26 to deliver real progress on climate change, I think time has come for us to come up with more coordinated efforts that can also deal with the challenges on on water, on air, and on the protection of ocean and biodiversity. Actually, we need to draw upon all these um, experiences and innovative solutions that develop globally to deal with uh, this local emission. In China, we tried to promote environmental transparency so as to empower a, and enable a multi-stakeholder approach to deal with the pollution. Today, thanks to the historic progress made in environmental transparency, we've been able to follow and track the performances of millions of companies, color code them and locate them on the, on the digital map. And the data is being widely used to enable green supply chain and green finance. And our blue map app has also been used as a tool in public supervision and also to facilitate crowdsourcing. Through this concerted efforts, we have seen remarkable progress made in pollution control, both on water and air. China managed to cut its air pollution level by half in just eight years of time. Uh, that's roughly the, the time frame we need uh, to achieve a 45% reduction in our carbon emission globally to, if we want to keep the 1.5 degrees Celsius target alive. Today, we're facing all this headwind, uh, and this looming global energy crisis with a global pandemic, which is, has yet to be put under control. And our mission is far from accomplished. Within China, we're still facing the, the challenge of on groundwater restoration and uh, on the pollution control of our coastal sea. With all of this, uh, I think we need to tap into the power of transparency in a multi-stakeholder approach. I think we have the uh, better chance to succeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there's no time to lose as this decade would be the most critical to the future of humanity. And as the developer of Blue Map, we look forward for their opportunities to communicate and to collaborate with all of you. Thank you.
Uh, yeah, well, thank you, Mahjong, if you can hear me somewhere in your dreams um, for that video that you sent over. And so, yeah, that's the end of session two, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. And again, friendly reminder, if you'd like to donate to the Citizen Science Project, which is the first in the world of its kind, here is the QR code that you can just scan. Or you can go onto our website and donate there. So unfortunately, that is the last you'll be hearing of my lovely voice for a while. And it's time for me to hand you over to my lovely co-host, Alejandro Prescott Cornejo, who is the marketing associate at Mongo Bay. And for those of you who don't know, Mongo Bay is one of the oldest magazines for environmental journalism. So it's super exciting, full water science policy, another uh, magazine for environmental journalism to have Mongo Bay here. So, yeah, over to you, Alejandro. Thank you so much, uh, Eliana, and everyone else who's presented today. It's actually been a, a fantastic time, and I'm very happy to be here on behalf of, uh, of Manga Bay. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about ourselves, uh, like Ellie said, we're in an online environmental science and conservation news outlet, and we provide the world with independent and fact-based journalism that creates accountability, informs decisions, and catalyzes conservation solutions globally. You know, I'm very happy to work with a team of, you know, over 60 staff and more than 800 contributors around the world that are producing incredible journalism, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, for these reasons, you know, we're very happy to accept Water Science policy, Policy's invitation to participate in this session and share with you the importance of, you know, continued efforts in environmental journalism and science communications. So that's enough about me and Manga Bay. Um, now, I just kind of like to continue and say that I'd like to highlight Water Science Policy's partnership with the International Resources Association uh, with the support of UNESCO in launching uh, the Groundwater Photo Story Contest. So the call is now open for photographers and the theme uh, for World Water Week next year is groundwater. Um, in fact, Water Science Policy is aiming to have a photo book published next year. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Okay, and now um, my colleague Chris is gonna play a video for just a second. What is groundwater and why is it so important? Groundwater is the world's most important source of fresh water. It supplies 2 billion people with drinking water and is used for irrigation of the largest share of the world's food supply. However, in many regions around the world, groundwater reserves are depleting as the resource is being pumped faster than it is being renewed. Additionally, in many cases, we are still clueless about how long we can keep extracting these water reserves before groundwater depletion will have devastating impacts impacts on the environmental and socio-economic systems. Indeed, these devastating effects are already being observed. Hello, my name is Gabriel Eckstein and I'm the president of the International Water Resources Association. Are you a photographer passionate about water, the environment and climate change issues? If the answer is yes, then I strongly encourage you to apply to Water Science Policies groundwater photography competition. Did you know that groundwater supplies drinking water for 51% of the entire U.S. population and 99% of the rural population? Groundwater also helps to grow our food. 64% of groundwater is used for irrigation to grow crops. In addition, groundwater is an important component in many industrial processes. And of course, groundwater is also a critical source of recharge for lakes, rivers, and wetlands. Our friends at Water Science Policy would love to have you submit your photos depicting groundwater in its various forms. So please send your submissions and let's show the world how critical and fantastic groundwater really is. As director of the UNESCO World Water Assessment Program, I'm very pleased to help draw attention to water science policies, groundwater photography competitions. Many people around the world live in groundwater depleted regions, yet it is very challenging to show this problem to the public. The fact is uh, that this uh, resource is stored to the underground and hence it is invisible to people. The real challenge to a photographer or a journalist is then how to represent it, but it is possible. I hope this competition can produce impactful images that convey the complexity and challenges and beauty of groundwater and will help give visibility to this invisible but crucial resource.
IWRA and UNESCO have collaborated with WSP before, and we are proud to have their endorsement for this competition. If you are up to the challenge of documenting groundwater, you can now submit your best photo story to contact at watersciencepolicy.com until the 20th of February. Check out our event page for all the submission details. The three winners will be announced on World Water Day 2022 and receive a financial prize and will be featured in an educational groundwater photography book to be launched in 2022. All other submissions will be considered for publication via Water Science Policy's website as well as inclusion in the photography book. Thank you for that. Wow, that is uh, that was an incredible movie. The first time I've seen it. And, you know, together with Fancy Tech's uh, movie before, I mean, I'm really happy to see the kind of content that Water Science Policy is producing. Um, now, for our next session, I'm going to hand the mic over to uh, my colleague, Silvia. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, so, well, let me first of all um, uh, tell you a bit more about um, this picture. Um, with this image, I'm taking you to the Philippines and to the Pasig River in Manila, which is with no doubt one of the most polluted rivers in the world in terms of micro and surface concentration of plastic waste entering the marine environment. This is also mainly to inform, maybe due to informal settlers and remaining factories that also dump their wastes in the river since the late thirties. So it effectively is a huge uh, serious system. And by the 1990s, the Pasig River was considered biologically dead. Although efforts to, the, uh, to revive the river system began since the, um, the beginning of the nineties, um, with the Pasig River Rehabilitation Programs, there's still a huge gap in terms of environmental awareness and coverage of environmental news in the Philippines. And so this is why um, Water Science Policy actually uh, got in touch with uh, youth-led organizations um, in the Philippines, um, such as the Association of Young Environmental Journalists, um, to develop um, a project, which is the, the third uh, project that, that you see here on the screen, um, which is a course for young journalists in uh, Manila. The main idea behind the project is to train a group of Filipino journalists on reporting news on water, sanitation, and hygiene. So the, the major goal is to raise environmental awareness and also to build advocacy networks by engaging and educating on environmental sustainability through youth development and media training. So why we want to do that? Um, this is mainly because uh, we believe that young people have the distinctive ability and responsibility to help further environmental action through storytelling, which is very important. So with this project, our vision is to tell positive stories about solutions being developed by individuals, communities, governments, and businesses, which deviate from the pessimism of environmental, environmental issues and news, and so bring a bit more of a progressive attention um, through the lens of youth reporting. Um, we calculated about 15,000 euros for this project um, with an approximate number of 10 young journalists to be trained um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the field um, and in Manila on theoretical and practical skills um, across different modules. So there will be theoretical modules and practical modules on how to report on environmental news. And this project would run for um, about a year. And um, so uh, this, is, um, this, is, this is what it is about. And, um, um, and uh, there is a donation um, page for this project as well. So um, uh, really encourage you to, to donate for this. And um, now I would like to turn it over to um, my colleague Abhishek. Um, who is going to tell you a little bit more about uh, uh, wash issues and uh, solutions um, to global problems. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sylvia. Um, if you don't mind, could I share my screen? Perfect. Um, am I sharing the right screen? Wait, 
Yeah, we can is see it, your screen. Yes. Is it is it the right screen? Is it is it the correct yes. screen? Yes. 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 So I come yes. for wash. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So um, thank thank you very much. <clears throat> um, so in in today's talk, I'm all all I'm going to talk about is is what is SciComm or science communication? Why is it particularly important for WASH? And also give a couple of tips on how to go about it. So what is science communication? It's defined as the use of appropriate skills. No, guys, I'm kidding. This is not what science communication is. Well, it is. It's important that we need to recognize that we need to be precise in language. We need to uh, communicate within the scientific audiences itself. But the science communication that I'm talking about is fairly simple. It's how do we distill technical information to more understandable messages and, and stories for public consumption? Which means if the scientists are talking about a new discovery of apples, how can they convert that into messages for the public so that they don't understand it's oranges, but rather it's apples, right? Um, this could be done in many different ways, uh, you know, whether it's in-person talks, podcasts, blogs, et cetera, et cetera. Two important things that we need to keep in mind is social media. It's more than clear that the science communication of the future will be in social media. The science communication and climate activism and environmental activism is also going to happen in a much larger scale on social media. That's one. The other one is how do we communicate science with respect to specific target audiences, if it's possibly decision makers, mayors, and, and so on. And why is this important? It's because, of course, we need to educate the people because there's a lot of misinformation, fake news, et cetera, going around. But also we want to inspire the next generation of scientists, increase public funding for uh, doing science, and of course, making it accessible. And the most important quote here that always comes to my mind when we talk about science communication is, is it's, it's not a separate job, it's part of making science because science isn't finished until it's communicated. And why is it particularly important for WASH? Because WASH as a field already has a lot of interactions with the public, whether it's behavior change communications or otherwise. And as a field, we often talk about the the lack of funding of, of hundreds of billions of dollars that's required for uh, achieving the SDGs by 2030. And this is one way to leverage public conscious in order to get more funding for WASH. And of course, we also need to do this targeted advocacy for, with decision makers. But a larger problem is all within the WASH sector is also that we often try to reinvent the wheel because there's poor knowledge transfer. There's not much talk of failure. If there is a project, a pilot project that's happened, let's say in India, and a similar thing is being tried out in, in, in uh, uh, Zambia, then we don't know what happened in one place and we often try to reinvent the wheel and, and so on. So this has to change. And one example about failure of sorts in science communication within the wash field is from a field that I work in, which is citywide inclusive sanitation arguably the biggest paradigm shift that's happening in the war sector in the recent past, because billions of dollars are being invested in this, millions of lives are being impacted, but not a single mainstream news media outlet has made coverage on CYs. And that really is, is, is such a big disconnect in the wash field. And that is particularly why I'm really fond of water science policy and, and, the, and the new uh, uh, journalism program that they're talking about. There needs to be more coverage of watch related activities from the PR and, and the news and the journalists uh, field, but also within the watch field, we need to talk, uh, do more science communication and, and project communication. And how do we do this? Well, there's a lot of stuff that's written on this, but I'm, I just wanna highlight a couple of important ones. When as watch professionals, we uh, design projects, we need to budget for science communication within these projects, both in terms of money and time. And we need to see science communication as a two-way street. We need to listen and adapt our projects accordingly. Similarly, with respect to more specific uh, tips on uh, communicating science for WASH, of course, we need to try to simplify jargons 
but at the same time we shouldn't take the audience for granted and and dumb it down and the most important thing here is also there's a lot of things is written on on water on on wastewater treatment on on uh, desalination and so on but a lot of it is behind paywalls or in many cases it's it's written in languages uh, that the common person doesn't necessarily understand in detail so we need to think about removing paywalls uh, writing it in more accessible languages and so on and this is where i think wsp's role uh, comes in and they've been doing a fantastic job primarily because they remain a neutral platform this high quality vetting it reaches young people and this translation services and it's in different formats not just blog articles we saw some amazing videos right now and and a lot of this all finally comes down to this innovative collaborative projects like the wash course for young filipino journalists that we just heard about so in the end my wish and hope for wsp through this of no not just this fundraiser but in the long term is that wsp scales up but continues to do this high quality wash science communication that has that they have shown is possible at at with, with so much passion and and uh, and uh, uh, also targeting the right audience so i'm really hopeful for wsp um, if you want to follow more about science communication wash of course i'm i'm on a couple of social media but i think uh, I want to write more for WSP and and communicate a lot more science from uh from our research on on WSP. So thanks a lot for um this opportunity guys. Thank you so much Abhishek. It's uh, it's really nice to hear about this and uh, as a science communicator I fully agree <laughs> with what you said for sure. Uh so thanks. Uh our next speaker is Deepa, the director and co-founder of Athena Economics, where she works closely with governments and foundations to provide advisory support on urban sanitation and finance. Deepa holds a master's degree in economics from the National University of Singapore. So, here we go. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh so it's wonderful to be here with all of you. Uh at the outset I want to congratulate uh Chris and Sylvia. Really, I think as someone who's had to start an organization and grow it i think what you guys have done in a year is is incredible uh and i think is a testament to sort of some of the things uh i think ellie talked about early on about passion it takes a lot of passion and commitment to have gotten as far as you have so congratulations at the outset um and like alejandro introduced i'm not a media expert i'm here in my so I'm an economist by background and I've spent the last 10 years working with governments and thinking about the role of governments in shaping public services like water and sanitation and I watched and learned uh, on the job the incredibly powerful role that media can play in changing policy in changing legislation and in changing the lives of people um and i'm really here to share some of those experiences as a way of reiterating the need for more support to the kinds of things wsp is starting to do um i'm going to share screens i'm sorry i don't have very fancy slides but uh here are some ideas that i can you can you see my slides yes we can see awesome so Great. i think one of the things i want to and i know this is one of the first things we talk about is how to to try and communicate better with audiences that are not necessarily uh fully acquainted with sanitation jargon and i want to start by saying that there is a much greater responsibility when we talk about water and sanitation and specifically i urge wsp to also think about sanitation specifically because not all public services are are the same i i do think that they all come with what we call different political salience which is there is governments have different levels of interest politically to want to focus on certain kinds of services where the political payoffs are higher and often those are things where there is direct attributability to political intervention or administrative intervention and it's measurable the outputs are measurable and visible when you think about for instance a space and i and again even within water there are water quality is less visible infrastructure particularly standpoints or network water perhaps is more visible therefore 
it's easier to hold governments accountable to delivering a stand post, but it may not be just as easy to get them to focus on water quality. Similarly, community sanitation actually is much lower on the ladder on political salience and attractiveness, uh, simply because the the it while sanitation has a lot of the qualities of a public good, the the personal benefits from sanitation are not visible or measurable except in the long term. And you know, we're always going to have this dilemma of having to create, you know, a big public health crisis or a political gamble to create conditions that are amenable um, for, for good political payoff. So I think the first thing I want to communicate here is that there is a much greater journalistic responsibility and role in holding governments accountable and in shaping public opinion uh, on these aspects to water and sanitation. I want to use two examples, very recent examples and under the last year of how the media through very powerful human interest stories has shaped policy and has, has shaped legislation. And I think it's important to talk about good examples to reiterate, this is not a theory, it, it's not something we're all saying, it's happening now and there is value in paying more attention and dedicating more resources to this topic. Uh, this image that you see here is an image from less than two weeks ago where uh, it's a religious festival where people, particularly in the north of India, come out to celebrate a, 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 a festival called the Chat Puja. And as part of that festival, they offer um, their prayers in a river. And this is the river Yamuna. So they were very powerful images of people standing in toxic form in one of the most popular rivers in the north called the Yamuna which was used, I think, incredibly well by the media to highlight the persistent issues on river pollution that continues to persist. And there were some really interesting articles and I'm really glad this was brought up in the introduction to the session about the technical issues, but weaved into a human interest story really beautifully. So it captured the imagination and the interest of the public. It allowed, allow for this issue to get escalated and go into the political corridors in a manner that it wouldn't have if not for the role of journalism and being able to weave in all of the critical issues, the rather technical ones, but really through a very powerful human interest narrative. Uh, some of you might have even seen this. This is another very powerful image uh, from probably over a year ago, uh, where a 54 year old sanitation worker is being lifted out of a pit uh, or is being helped out of a pit by his co-worker. And he, he he spent 35 years in as being a manual scavenger in India. Thank you so much, Deepa. That was that was awesome. It's really nice to hear that. And definitely power journalism, pff, revolutionary. Um, so I just like to thank you all for, uh, I guess, taking the time to be with me here. That's the end of uh, my little spiel with uh, water science policy. And now I'll pass it back to uh, Ellie. So thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you to everyone who spoke. Um, also, thank you Alejandro for co-hosting with me. Thank you, attendees, for attending. I hope you enjoyed the gala and I hope that you learned a lot, which is important. Um, and I would just, yeah, I'd like to take this time to reiterate that even though we are basically run by volunteers, we've already seen so many results. You know, like we've published articles, podcasts, policy briefs, videos, and as it should be, the only way is up. And we're hoping to expand our content to make it even more inclusive and accessible. Uh, you know, exploring different means of communication and mediums, such as poetry and documentaries and art. And we all love art here, right? Um, so that is why we would be so grateful and appreciative of any donations that you could spare today, which again, you can either um, do by scanning the QR code or by going onto the website. And if you would like to know more about our work or have any questions, or just generally feel like having a chat with me, my email is just my full name at watersciencepolicy.com.
So Eliana at watersitespolicy.com. And I will be um, the, the key communicator after this conference, let's say. So that's all from me. Um, and yeah, back to you, Tyler. Thanks, Ellie. So I um I wanted to thank everyone again for uh, for participating, and I also really appreciate the engagement in the chat. There's been a lot of really interesting comments shared, uh, questions as well as opportunities for partnerships, and we really look forward to connecting further with with all of you. I wanted to pick up a few questions briefly in here. Um, so I no noticed that some were answered already, but there's one I wanted to grab. Um, so I, I noticed that Colin asked uh, how blockchain benefit Mexico City's water supply when the water utility is public, tariffs are heavily subsidized, and even so, many water users don't pay their, their bills anyway. Um, I, I noticed that, that uh, Neil kind of responded a bit to that, but I'd, I'd be interested to hear if there's any further um, comments you want to share uh, with regard to that question. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, thanks, Colin, for a great question. C kind of just hitting on the point there that technology can't be a silver bullet; it has to work in tandem with, you know, strong institutions and good enabling environment. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so it has to work in tandem with just a strong enabling environment. So, kind of the point of the paper, which it's it's kind of hard to explain all the uh, kind of kind of intricacies of it in five minutes, but. Uh, using things like smart contracts can help streamline these types of things that are inefficiencies in the status quo in real life that lead to kind of these types of issues with a strong enabling environment. So kind of the things I mentioned in uh, the response I just made or something like the reason why many water users don't pay their bills are because, you know, there's a perception that they aren't receiving quality services. Why pay for something you didn't receive, right? If water isn't consistently available, if there's poor quality, if there's a perception that, you know, maybe richer areas are being repaired quicker than my neighborhood, I'm not going to pay my utility. And I think the stat, and Colin, you can tell me if you know a more updated number. The last one I saw was about 42% of consumers don't pay their tariffs in Ciudad de Mexico. Um, so the idea is something like blockchain can help fix this by building validated trust, uh, validated data, a validated record that can't be edited by anyone that shows this is when we repaired this utility at this time. This is when we, uh, this is what the, our latest sensor says was the quality of the water you received. This is how long it was open. The idea is having some kind of decentralized record that can't be manipulated by anyone is supposed to build trust between these groups. And so what that, the idea is that these things work in tandem, right? Is blockchain is then, then leads to more consumers paying their tariffs, which leads to short-term financing for maintenance and operations. And the idea is also using blockchain can help reduce the transaction costs for attracting commercial financing. So uh, Colin made a great point that SACMEX, the utility in Ciudad de Mexico is a public utility. So uh, it's a different type of financing requirement, but you know, like Mexico has you know, raised billions of dollars for sustainable development projects through green bonds. And a recent report from a the bank HSBC found that issuing green bonds on the blockchain can reduce associated transaction costs by up to 10 times. Uh, and so by streamlining these type of investments, pledging more, at, uh, more resources into expanding uh, utility infrastructure, upgrading, uh, can help build also stronger enabling environments. So the idea is that, sorry for a long tangent here, that these two things come in tandem. Technology is not a silver bullet, but the idea is technology can support a stronger enabling environment. Thanks so much for that very um, thoughtful and informed response, Neil. So I'm going to pick up another question I see here. One of the biggest challenges I see in water is that we water people are typically terrible communicators and communicate among ourselves. Uh, WSP seems to be a great way of helping us communicate better, but how can water science policy help us communicate to other communities? So this is a really good question. And I may crowdsource a response from a few people involved in WSP. I think my instinct is just leaning on the, the kind of ethos of, of this organization, which is to um, to make science very accessible, to make policy very accessible, and to make it accessible in multiple languages, to communicate with folks who, you know, whether they're speaking uh, Amharic or Arabic or uh, Hindi or any, any language where a lot of water issues are prevalent, just being able to communicate directly in that language and in a concise and meaningful way, and to also use, use media, like use uh, powerful images, photos, videos, as a part of the, the strength of communicating 
um, the most critical issues that we face. I, so that's just a quick improvised response that I feel um, related to water science policy, but I'd be happy to um, hear from anyone else on the team that, that wants to share a few further thoughts on, um, on how uh, we can, at water science policy, help communicate to other communities. So I see, I see Torkel has his hand up, so I, I, um, I'll give you a chance to briefly speak. Yeah, um, I chair Stockholm Water Week um, for the last 10 years, scientific committee. Uh, every year we try to, in Water Week to address the problems uh, of sectors worldwide and other sectors. It was extremely difficult to get energy people, food people, health people, to really take an interest uh, in water. Because a lot of our communication, a lot of our networks are very water-centric. So I think one of the big communication challenges uh, and networking challenges, probably also for WSP, is to reach out to those who suffer from uh, uh, water shortages, uh, water issues, uh, in their language. Uh, I wonder, for example, in this session, whether this session, whether the 80 people who were here were 80%, 90% percent water people uh, talking to each other. Like when we just in Glasgow saw a water pavilion with water people, again, talking to each other, maybe not so much to the climate negotiate. I mean, we have a serious issues getting out of our water box. I talked about one, water and ocean. But there are as many as uh, SDGs, in fact. So to me, that is a big issue, and I'm, I was really happy to hear, see the the, <laughs> the vibrant uh, uh, interventions from people on communicating science and and so forth. But we got to communicate that outside our own circles; otherwise, we are not going to make a big difference. Definitely. Thanks. Thanks for that remark, Torquil. I'm gonna, um, I see that Deepa has her hand up, so I'll, I'll give her an opportunity to intervene. Thanks, Tyler. I just think, I think all the money is given to engineers and economists and planners. We have no idea how to write and communicate. Let's please acknowledge that. Look at the briefs, look at the reports, look at the presentations that are made at World Water Week, that's made at the UNC Health Conference. It's fantastic. I love it. I learn a lot from it, but it's the same 200 people in the room. And I think that's a great question. I think it, the messages don't go beyond that because the funding is so concentrated on folks like us who don't know how to communicate these ideas to, to people that are not the 200 people that we're talking to over and over again. I do think funding is a problem. I do think it's a, it is a complicated problem because it is not easy to, to finance media engagements within countries. It's a sensitive area. I think which is where independent media platforms like WSP and the sort of retail crowdsourcing is an incredibly interesting model. And I'm curious to see how it will play out. But I do think that there's a huge reason we're not resourced to communicate. How much money goes into communication versus the actual work? Really good points. Um, so thank, thank you for, for sharing your thoughts as well. I, I think... Um, we have a little bit of time left, so I'd, I'd love to hear from Abhishek as well. Yeah, uh, just to build on uh, what Torquil and, and Deepa said, there's two main things. One is even within the water sector, there are silos. Um, water and, and sanitation folks don't often talk to each other. Water resource people and ocean, ocean uh, folks don't talk to each other. So within the water sector itself, there's not much communication happening. And that is the first set of silos that WSP has to aim to break. And they're already doing a good job by bringing a lot of these people to the same platform. Then the second one is, then how do we start communicating with other people in other different sectors, whether they are involved in environmental advocacy and environmental work, or whether they are contributing to some of the crisis that's happening around the world, right? So for the other sort of the uninitiated audiences, what we need to try and do is communicate with different forms of of uh, medium. For example, uh, Turkil, um, you've been on, on the Stockholm Scientific Committee for a year. And I, in, the, in the last five years that I've attended, the last three years, I think, started having these live sketches that, uh, you know, these. And 
those are the sketches that are actually going ahead and communicating what happened in the session. Nobody comes and reads the session notes. So you need more of these creative forms and more lucid forms of science communication, of you know advocacy communication and so on. And that's where I think WSP has already started making some headway. And I hope they continue with that way. Of course, you need the basic science that the scientists and academics and others do. But it's this conversion into more useful, readable things uh, um, that, that really matter. And I'm really happy to see that um, those things are happening now with WSP. Thanks so much, Abhishek. Um, so I see Sylvia has her hand up, so I'll give her a chance to, to briefly talk. Um, thank you, Tyler. And just, um, you know, to, to, to build on what everybody was saying and also Abhishek said, um, I remember I was talking about bridging different gaps uh, at the beginning, so natural sciences and social science, policy and practice, etc. But I think also the gaps that we're trying to bridge is really across sort of like formats. I mean, we need boxes because we need to think into boxes and we need structure, but we also need to think outside of these boxes and make linkages. And the one way we're trying to do this is also, is also through um, arts and multimedia uh, channels. I mean, you've seen some of the videos that we've shown today. This is one of the ways we're doing it. And also in terms of photography, photography is a very powerful tool to do so. Um, and, uh, and, and, and photographers are also a very underpaid category, unfortunately. So we really need also to, to, to understand that there are some categories of people that also don't have the means and the resources to bring up the issues. And that's why also our photo competition is coming in um, and so we really hope that uh, that with this we can uh, we can actually bring some uh, um, innovation also in the way we talk about water because at the end of the day we are overloaded with information and uh, you know the thing is um, if we can um, look at the picture and um, have a different way of interacting with with topic um, that could be um, perhaps more uh, powerful in a way so I don't say that one thing uh, um, uh, equals the other or one thing has to substitute the other, but uh, yeah, I just think that the different means of doing, uh, of communicating uh, the same issues. So over to you, Tyler. Thanks so much. Um, so I see uh, a few more questions here. We are running a little bit out of time, unfortunately. We'd, we'd really love to follow up and continue this conversation um, for any, any folks who've reached out through the chat and otherwise. Um, so I, I really just want to emphasize that this is uh, water science policy is something that we're all very passionate about, and we're really fortunate to have so much interest um, in terms of volunteers, contributors, um, folks who are interested in donating, and it means a lot to us. And so I just want to remind everyone, um, if you are interested in, in donating, uh, there's the a web link, and for those who um, the web link may not be accessible to certain countries um, through PayPal, uh, we also have our banking information available as well. And this, the, these contributions are um, integral and essential to building our capacity to educate, empower, and um, work with partners to develop water solutions to some of the world's most pressing water security issues. And uh, we hope that this is just the beginning of a conversation. And we thank you so much for attending and hope to, hope to stay in touch in the future. So thanks so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you very much, Tyler, for moderating.